So my name's Tom Tabor. This is Rob Beersford, and we're with Team WikiSpeed. And my next car is going to get 100 miles per gallon. <laughs> so what we do is we actually build highly efficient, affordable, safe, functional, and fun to drive cars. And we do it with an agile, lean, scrum process. Can you hear me? Is it still on there? OK, good. Excellent, thank you. So that Agile Lean Scrum process is not only goes into the manufacturing processes of what we do, but also the way that our team organizes as a collaborative distributed team around the world. And so we're going to talk more about that. Why is it in manufacturing that things take so long to change? If you look at one of these hybrid cars here, it's a six year period for it to gain just two more miles per gallon in efficiency, and that's its main selling point. So it kind of seems kind of odd, doesn't it? And part of that reason is that the manufacturing process itself is so embedded in just staying the same, that it costs so much to build the tools and the dyes and things to do these processes that things just can't change quickly. If an engineer has a brand new radical idea to, to implement, it could take 10 years or even 25 years to get into the development cycle just to pay for the door that already exists out there or whatever part that happens to be. And it operates a lot like the old software teams back in the mainframe days. You kind of build this giant software project. It becomes this beast that just goes into a maintenance cycle and it's forever maintained. We operate more like a new software team, an agile team. And we have an iteration of seven days. So every seven days, we look at our current state and we look, what can we do in the next seven days to move us forward as a whole team, team-wide? And so it allows us to develop and deploy new technologies, new ideas very, very quickly. So how did all this get started? It started when they announced the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, and they put a $10 million purse out there to build a 100 mile per gallon car that could seat four people, was comfortable to drive, had all the amenities, and was safe and road legal as well. And nothing like this existed before, but they wanted to see if it could possibly be done. In fact, there were 100 mile per gallon cars at the time, but they weren't really what the consumer market was looking for. They were more like a bobsled. They set one person, and they really didn't meet what were considered road legal safety standards. And no cup holders at all. No cup holders for sure. <laughs> so 136 teams joined together, or 136 teams joined the competition to win this $10 million prize. And we were one of those teams actually centered in the middle of the country at the time in Colorado. And many of these teams were from prestigious uh, institutions, universities such as MIT, or, or companies as well, such as Tesla, that were competing in this, this competition. And many of them had millions of dollars in funding behind them. We were not one of those teams. <laughs> we had Joe Justice, our founder. And he was a single guy building highly lightweight and efficient cars out of his garage. And he heard about the XPRIZE and, and looked at his wife and said, well, you know that down payment we had saved up to buy a house with? What if instead we built a car and entered it in the XPRIZE? And she looked at him and said, amazingly, Joe, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And if you don't do it, you'll always regret it and wonder what could have been. So they went for it, and the race was on. And so they moved into a smaller apartment, actually, and, and lived a little bit more e economically, and actually put everything in to, to go for this prize. And Joe got on the net and started blogging about what he was doing and asking questions. And he had things like just figuring out a parking brake that would actually work well. Because parking brakes, typically, they, they slide against the rotor a little bit. And that's fine with just your normal car that you don't really care too much about its efficiency. But if you're trying to achieve 100 miles per gallon, just having a little bit of friction in the system is, is a horrible, horrible thing. So he found people that stay up late at night and think about parking brakes. And they came to him and had the ideas and suggestions. And these people <laughs> exist in the world. And you can reach out to them. And he found them. And, and they came, collaborated, and then they said, hey, we love what you're doing. We want to actually help out, too. And so this group of volunteers formed around the whole group. And it actually grew to be 44 team members in four countries, all collaboratively putting input into this and building a car that competed in three months. So really something else. Really, it was a great thing. A, a lot of heart, a lot of dedication went into the competition. And the other teams around that were seeing what was happening were really impressed with the way that the Wikispeed team kind of worked together. We had a lot of uh, moving parts and, and different parameters that were changing on us at the time. So for instance, the race was initially going to be a race in downtown Manhattan on a really tight race course that had turns and stops and starts and sprints and things like that. And that, that required one kind of configuration of the car. 
Then it was going to be changed to a cross-country race where it actually stopped in different cities along the thing, and that required a completely different design. And many of the teams had to start over all the way from scratch. We didn't. We actually built a modular design and had it something that we could actually modify very quickly and iterate over time. And so that actually led to us being able to move and change with different requirements and, and judgings that were uh, happening during the X Prize. And eventually the contest was held at Michigan International Speedway. And we did quite well. We actually placed 10th, tied 10th for the X Prize. And we got a lot of great press out of that and a lot of accolades for the effort that we put into it. That was ahead, by the way, of MIT and Tesla, so. It was, yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and as a result of that, we got invited to the largest auto show in the world in Detroit, Michigan, this last January. Um, the Detroit North American International Auto Show, which has three quarters of a million participants actually walk through the show. So it was a huge venue for us to present our technology. And so we thought, well, we're going to be placed in the basement with the electric cars and uh, the green economy cars, that sort of thing. Said, so, no, you're actually going to be on the main showroom floor. So the pressure was on. And we knew that we wanted to have something that was a little bit prettier to look at than our orange car because we had great mechanicals, we were highly efficient, and we wanted something that matched that same technology on the outside. So we designed a really cool looking car. The only problem was to actually make this car a reality using traditional manufacturing techniques, it would cost $36,000 in three months time. And really neither one of those was an option for us. So we had to come up with something new. So what we did, we sent Joe Justice, our founder, to composite school. And there he kind of learned the secret black art magics and science of, of laying carbon fibers and looked at the processes they used for laying carbon fibers and thought of a simpler way to do it. So we used a home-built CNC machine um, that we bought on Craigslist, actually, at a great discount, too. <laughs> I'm telling you, this stuff exists out there. It's fantastic. <laughs> the amazing things the internet can provide you. And with that machine, we took six-inch blocks of foam and, and created our, our car out of foam and then glued all those six-inch sheets of uh, foam together and, and had a working buck. And so from that, we actually laid down carbon fiber, structural carbon fiber on top of it. And this process took a total of three days and a total cost of $800. <laughs> so learning ways to do things faster, more efficient, and, and getting more productivity out of them is what Wikispeed is really all about. And fortunately, the car looked beautiful. We were placed on the main showroom floor between Ford and Chevy. Quite a prestigious place. And the press was amazing. They came out. We had press coverage from all over the world in all different languages. Um, they said things that we wouldn't have even said about ourselves, but it really are at the core of what we do, such as Wikispeed is a reminder of the true spirit of the Detroit Auto Show. Some companies are still building mind-boggling revolutionary cars because they can. And it really sums up the spirit of what we're doing and, and why we do it. Then we got a three-page article in Automobile Magazine, one of the most prestigious and conservative auto magazines out there. And they told our story, Average Joe's Can Do Car Company, of kind of the history of what we're doing and the vision for our future as well. And that attracted more attention to us and helped our, our team grow as more people found out about it. Then we got a call from Discovery Channel Canada and their top rated show that has three and a half million viewers a week, Daily Planet, did an expose on us and it just came out this last October on Halloween. And phenomenal little piece that we have. And then we had press coverage from Wired Magazine, Popular Science, Popular Mechanics, uh, TechCrunch, New York Times Online. There was just a, a plethora of things that, that came out. And from all of that, we said, well, we want to take this farther. We didn't just do the X Prize to win the prize. We actually want to move forward. We are a licensed manufacturer car company. We want to build that car for the future and actually make a difference for social good. So right now, this is several weeks ago, this is our new uh, core, our new foam body that's being built in our Maryland shop. And it's a gorgeous body built by Ro Mo <laughs> Rob Moorbacher. And uh, it's, in reality, it's ready to actually, it's, it's along a little farther than this, and it's a few more weeks before we pull out our first structural carbon fiber body that will look like this. And so it really changes the game for us for having a car that's highly desirable as a commuter vehicle. That's a fun car and a, 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 a good looking car to drive around. And, and we all kind of want one, actually, as soon as possible. And Tom, <laughs> I team. wanted to add that um, what's interesting about Rob, who designed the car, is he designed and sent off his CAD to uh, the CNC group 
uh, Rob lives in Germantown, Maryland, and he had this chance to design a car, and then he goes to the auto show to see it. At that time, he then meets for the first time the rest of the team. So here's a guy operating all the way across the country, very independently and very effectively, but through his association with our group, he's yeah. doing things that to him seem amazing. He's just a young man, and to us, they seem amazing as well. And there's so many stories like that within our group. We have uh, team members in Germany that are doing amazing things in Germany and Spain and doing electronics in England. We just sent a, a pedal over to England so that they yeah. can actually work with it over there and then send it back to us. So it's, it's pretty amazing having a group that's, that's like this. And how do we do it all? It's really based on modularity. So Joe, our founder, came from the software. He's an Agile Scrum coach, actually, and that's kind of his background. So we think of things in terms of software, even though we're building cars. It's kind of a strange way of doing it. And as such, we borrow ideas from the software world, such as object-oriented program, modularity, having things that fit together. And that really helped us out in the XPRIZE, because having a modular design allowed us to change designs to meet different requirements as those, as those became available. But it helps us in a manufacturing process as well. It kind of uh, cordons off different parts of functionality, different parts of cars, so if we change them, they don't actually change the whole car. So our engine module is a box that actually slides into the back of the chassis using just a, a, a lift jack. And it can be swapped out in just 10 minutes. It's just there's six structural lug bolts that hold it in place, which are like the same lug bolts that hold a tire onto the car. That engine that's within it happens to be a 1.8 liter Honda gasoline engine right now, and that's how we achieve that 100 mile per gallon rating. We just we use gasoline, we just use a lot less of it. We can swap that out with a hybrid engine. We can swap it out with a lithium ion battery engine. We can swap it out with an ethanol, a methanol, a propane, a green jello block that melts slowly in the sun. Whatever the latest technology is <laughs> that moves us forward efficiently, we will implement that, that, that technology, and that's one of the the ways that we think and the ways that we can operate. <coughs> so that modularity, just kind of looking at it as a cutaway, there's, you can see the different components and parts of the car here. And on the front of the car is a uh, front crush structure, so what people call a bumper. And our first version of that was actually this complex design, and it really did a good job of absorbing the impact, but it was difficult to manufacture. Um, it took a lot of time, that sort of thing. So we said, well, how can we simplify this and maybe even increase its, its usefulness? So we iterated through it. We're on our fourth iteration of that design right now, and it's actually been simplified. It's geometrically simpler. It's actually much more effective at absorbing crashes, and it costs less to manufacture. So going through an iterative process and not thinking, well, this is the only way to do it, is, is just how we, we do things, just looking to see how we can change things along the way. Safety, of course, is one of our big concerns, and one of the ways we achieve uh, the efficiencies that we do is by having a very, very lightweight car. It only weighs 1,400 pounds. So a lot of people say, well, light car, that can't be safe. There's no way. We've actually produced the lightest chassis in the world to achieve a five-star crash test rating equivalency, and that's the first time that's ever been done. And the way we do it is thinking a lot differently than the mainstream way of thinking about how to absorb crashes. We have an integrated a chassis body that as it's impacted from any side, the whole chassis absorbs the shock of that impact. So it's distributed across the entire chassis. And that allows us to have a much lighter design. It's essentially like having two I-beams that are then welded with big crossbars across it driving down the street. And so you're, you're kind of just surrounded and enclosed within this cage that, that protects the occupants within. So what are the methodologies we do to use all this? We use Lean, we use Agile, we use Scrum, Kanban boards, object-oriented programming, pairing and extreme programming, and even test-driven design. These are kind of our core parts of our culture and just the way we think about things. Neither one of us are actually Lean, Scrum, or Agile experts. We just know it experientially from being on the team more than anything else. And it's just the way that we live and think about things. Just examples of how we do this. Um, in Lean, we just use less stuff, and this is a lot of our team members and, and one of our core principles is just having a smaller impact on the environment. If we use less stuff, it's actually just good for the environment, and what's the point of doing all this if we're not doing it for the good of the environment? By using less stuff also, it's more efficient. It actually costs less, so we can do things more cheaply, and in the end, sell more affordable cars. So by using less stuff, we just uh, gain huge benefits and, and really no downsides, as long as we're maintaining all of our goals for safety and efficiency and, and those things. 
And, and I guess this picture here, what we're actually looking at is one of our team members, uh, Rob Huggins, who's actually using an $89 bandsaw, so a pretty cheap piece of technology, to actually cut and build our chassis. Now what he's replacing is a machine in traditional, traditional automotive, automotive manufacturing that's over a $100 million machine. So this process, we aren't locked into exactly how it's done. If we change our methodologies or if we even scale up our methodologies, we can invest in more equipment. But right now, this is the minimum requirement to get the job done that we need done. We're agile and, and, and able to make changes very quickly on the fly, and we don't shy away from change, we actually embrace it and look forward to it and plan for it as well. So every week uh, we get our current state of, our, of where our car is, where our whole project is, and what are the things we need to do next. And making those changes very quickly is just part of our culture. Um, we set up our physical workspaces in a modular, agile way as well. So we have a number of shops around the country and are soon expanding around the world. And there's actually two here in Seattle, in uh, Linwood and in Everett. And we set them up in a way that we have shelving that has clear bins in it. And those bins are labeled with the things that go within them. So for instance, there's a whole power tool section that has our sanders in one, our drills in another, our saws in another. Next to those are hand tools that have our hammers, our wrenches, our sockets, our screwdrivers. And they're kind of laid out so similar things are next to similar things. When you're a brand new team member, you come to the shop, you're given a quick tour of the shop and you kind of see things how they're laid out. And let's say that night, your job is to unbolt the front crush structure. Well, you'd kind of know how to do it. You'd go over to the section of tools, you'd see the hand tools, you'd find the right sockets. You'd go over and you'd have two sockets and you could quickly unbolt that and you'd actually be moving the team forward very quickly without having a lot of experience and knowledge or training, you can start contributing. And you'd of course be paired with somebody else that was making sure that you're doing the work correctly and we're having a good time doing it as well. So the socialization of it. We have collaborative work areas because it's, good to do. We don't want to be locked inside of cubicles or offices where we work in isolation. Our whole culture is working together as a team and getting momentum off just the energy of each other of moving stuff forward. And so those collaborative work environments are a big part of what we do. Sometimes we have people that are just work in other houses, maybe our web designers or something, they're doing it. But they're collaborating online with other parts of our team as well. So collaborative work areas physically and also virtually. We also use Scrum, so Scrum gives us a number of different concepts that, that play well into the way that we're organized and the way that we do business. But just having uh, specific roles and responsibilities. Everybody comes, just one minute. Everybody comes to the teams with uh, certain skill sets and certain desires, but they don't have to necessarily just stay within those skills that they, that they have. So say that somebody comes and doesn't have any automotive experience at all, but they want to be in the shop, they want to learn how to do things. And this is kind of, I'm, I'm not that much of a, a car guy, but I really like cars a lot. And so I've wanted to learn a lot from them. So since I've been working in the shop, I'm actually visiting from Las Vegas. I've been here in Seattle for two weeks just helping out in the shop. And I've done so many things, learned so many things. I've helped pull out the engine. I've helped uh, weld on the chassis. I've helped do all kinds of, of crazy cool things that I've never had the opportunity to do before. And it's been so exciting to do and just learned so much. It's been just a, a fantastic experience. So those roles and responsibilities can shift and you can take on, we're a completely volunteer organization, so you can take on new tasks that interest and excite you and learn new skills along the way. So we've had people learn very valuable TIG welding skills. Uh, our, one of our team members here, Kurt Roy, has become an expert uh, aluminum TIG welder just by being part of our team and using things like pairing with other people and using YouTube videos of best practices. So it's been quite fun for him to do that. Another part of our culture is our weekly stand-up meeting. So every Thursday night, tonight, at 6 p.m., we have a worldwide uh, team meeting call where everybody calls in and it gives a one-minute summary of what they've done. So what have they accomplished in the last week? What do they intend to accomplish in the coming week? And what blocks do they see to that? And so everybody goes to their stand-up, and at the end of the stand-up, we gather together all the roadblocks at the end, and whoever can has ideas of how to unblock those things, they pitch in and do it. And maybe it's pitching in a hand to help somebody out, maybe it's finding new resources or applying new technologies, whatever that happens to be. Out of that meeting, we also get our backlog items. So those backlog items go right to our Kanban board, and they actually prioritize, okay, what is it to be accomplished this week? What's our highest priorities to move us forward? And those things forward may be things about building on the car, but it could also be, um, our online uh, strategy of actually building our website so that people come there, they have great content, or 
uh, pushing out our YouTube videos around the world. So there's a lot of different things that we have going on within our organization more than just building cars. I mentioned the Kanban boards, and they actually exist in all of our facilities. You'll see here in the back of the room, they're, they're standing on the, the form here, but in the back is a whiteboard with sticky notes on it and four columns. The left one says the backlog, the next one over says in progress, and I'm sure there's a sticky note there that says sand the car body. And the next one over says uh, uh, waiting to be verified, and then the last one is done, completed work actually. So those Kanban boards gives us a physical way of actually looking and seeing how things are organized in that space. But that Kanban board is also digitally uh, displayed as well. So we actually take those post notes and put them into Scrummy software so that our whole team can see the entire project, everybody's effort, and all of our shops and all of our locations, what is actually happening and where is it, it's all going. Without having a lot of meetings, without having a lot of documentation, without having a lot of justification for what you're doing, everybody's moving the project forward at some level and creating great velocity in doing that That's as well. A good point, Tom. And it's so important when you have an all-volunteer group because you don't really know who's going to show up in any particular time. And it's very dynamic. And so they need a central place where they can find the next important task and to get an idea of how the workflow is going. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And it's really fun to be a part of, actually. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's the main thing. <laughs> um, it, the Kanban board also gives us a way of just kind of visualizing everything that's going on. There's so many parts and pieces that by having that, it gives us a snapshot. We can look down and we can see in a simple way without a whole lot of words what's actually going on. A lot of times you can get bogged down in emails and that sort of thing. But having the Kanban board just gives a simple way to visualize everything that's going on. We also use a lot of concepts from object-oriented programming. So I mentioned the modularity of the car and how things kind of just fit together. Um, we encapsulate functionality, just the same way you encapsulate functionality in software, we encapsulate functionality in modules. So this is a display of our suspension modules. And what these are are Skunk 2 Racing McPherson strut suspension systems that have been bolted onto 6061 T6 aluminum plates that are quarter inch thick those quarter inch thick plates have bolt holes in them. Those bolt holes match up with bolt holes on our actual chassis. Those bolt holes represent our interface. Just like you have an interface in software programming, this is our interface in a contract about those bolt holes being on both pieces so that when you get them there, you can actually put structural lug nuts through them and bolt them on. Now on the plates, we can actually put whatever thing we want to on there. So if we wanted to put a double wishbone suspension system on instead, we could apply that to the plate the same way, no problem. If we want to put tank, tank treads on there, we could do that. If we want to put boat pontoons or airplane wings on there, we could do that as well. Whatever goal we're trying to accomplish, we can just put them onto that, that module, and it doesn't affect any other modules in the system. I want articulated robotic legs. There you go. Articulated robotic I hadn't even thought of that before. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, we use extreme programming, so pairing together. And I mentioned this, just we get a lot of velocity when we actually work together as a group. So here we have two of our volunteers who are actually very proficient at building engines. But by working together, it's, they, they learn a bit more. So they learn some of the nuances from each other. They check each other's work just to make sure that nothing gets left out or forgotten. And it's a way of passing knowledge amongst the team without having to document it all, without having to do that. So it's just a way that we gain a lot of velocity. Sometimes we have a, a more senior member paired with a, a more junior member so that they can le learn things. And maybe that pairing will be the same two people but reversed because they have different skills in another area. Uh, we also swarm. So if we have a particular vexing block on our system, so we have something that's just holding us back from moving forward, we may apply eight people in one night to go, OK, we're going to wipe this one out and get it out. So Say it's the wiring, there's a short in the wiring harness, and nobody wants to deal with the wiring harness. So if we actually put eight people in the wiring harness, everybody kind of takes it and searches down and finds the thing. We get it out of the way, done, put it behind us, and we move on to the next thing. So it's a way to kind of quickly get those things uh, moving forward and, and gaining velocity. Everything we do is test driven. So we actually develop a test before we do it. This is a crash test, and this is kind of an obvious example that we want to pass a crash test before we can do anything else. But there's also tests on more simple tasks. So this last week, one of my tasks was installing the seats and seat covers that you saw in the car today. So to do that, we first developed the test. We had to actually weld in the bars on the bottom that are bolted into. And those had to be welded in such a way that they're at the correct distance from the steering module. They also had to be strong enough to withstand any crashes or any deformation. They also had to be put in there in a way that they interact with the seat belt harnesses as well to make sure those all work together. So those are all of our tests. 
once they're installed, we kind of checked off and saw that each one of those was a test and we could have success. Without the test, we couldn't have the success. By having the success, it actually builds excitement that we've got something accomplished and it builds morale and just velocity for a whole team. And that's just a huge thing. We'll actually take a video of that, put it out to our team, say, hey, here's what it accomplished this week in the shop. And, and we do that on a weekly basis. So how do we do it? Having such a widely distributed team all over, different people doing different things, we use a lot of these tools. And these are from companies that didn't really even exist 10 years ago, and many of these things weren't available even five years ago. So the way that we do this is really kind of a new technology, something that hasn't been seen in industry before. Um, by having collaborative tools that allow us to share ideas and, and do this in this way, it just creates the ability to do this in such a distributed fashion, actually. It's, it's kind of amazing what we accomplish on a weekly basis. And being part of this team, it's as much learning about the technologies and how to function as a team like this than it is about building cars. So it's the education that you get from it is quite amazing. So what are we doing next? Next, we are actually we were building cars and selling cars to, to the world now. And our cars uh, look very sleek, very cool, and they are, and we also want them to be affordable. So you can actually purchase our cars for $25,000, which is much less than a Tesla, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and get great efficiency from them, and uh, we, we just want to spread that out to the world. <laughs> and so we're going to change gears here a little bit, and Rob Beerser is going to take over and just show how being part of Wikispeed is, is uh, there's definitely an education in there, and every Every member of the team kind of they get out of it what they put into it, um, and and people may spend just two hours a week on it. People may take a few weeks or a few months off from the team then come back to us, but whatever it is that they do, whatever efforts put in, I find that it comes back in spades just through learning and through just the excitement that we build around it. So, off thanks, to you. Tom. You bet. Um, you don't mind clicking the slides along for me, maybe a little bit. So modularity appealed to me because my background was I used to be a public school teacher. I taught science for about 10 years up in the Everett School Districts. It's something I really believed in and I really loved. And trying to solve the kinds of problems that teachers come across when they're trying to reach their students um, created ideas in my head about what good education looks like. And I often saw it nearly implemented in the schools, but after about 10 years, I left a little bit frustrated, like a lot of teachers leave the system, um, because you just can't quite achieve the thing that you really, really know needs to be achieved. Wikispeed has helped me with that, and modularity turns out to be a big part of it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what my experience with Wikispeed has been and why I believe it's such an important, uh, an important new movement that has educational value as well as manufacturing and other business values. So when I started teaching, one of the things that I was excited about was hands-on competitive activities. So this is a Science Olympiad competition up at Belling, uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham. And that's the familiar truss or tower competition. So you have a, uh, a threaded steel rod that runs down the middle of it. And below a hole in the table is a heavy bucket that you keep adding sand to. So it's a destructive test to encourage the students to develop these strong designs. That destructive part is a little bit depressing, though, because you wreck the student's project and there's really nothing to show for it. And I think that that's an important piece in the end because these things have a way of kind of getting forgotten. When I was a student myself in college, I got really excited about this project. This is the Washington State University, University of Idaho hybrid electric vehicle. And in the early 90s, we were making a practical hybrid electric car for competition uh, put on by the big three automakers, Ford, uh, Ford Chevrolet, and, and Chrysler out in Detroit. It ran for three years and produced some pretty amazing hardware. I was really proud of our car. I was really involved with this team for two years, and it's a proper series hybrid vehicle. Now, a series hybrid means that the gasoline-powered engine is, is optimized to be efficient at one particular operating speed. And that at that speed, it then spins a generator, which recharges the batteries and then goes to an electric drive. It really is the way to do a hybrid electric car. But that's not the way that it's being done in industry right now. Most hybrids on the road right now 
are parallel hybrids, which means the engine's coupled one way or the other directly to the road. There might be a generator involved somewhere, but you still have to make an engine that is highly flexible and efficient and clean and powerful at all ranges throughout the, the RPM gauge. You've got to be efficient at all those ranges. That actually necessitates a lot of compromises that vastly complicates the design of the internal combustion engine. But this is more or less universal in transportation systems now, which is strange because the, there's nothing uh, futuristic or space age going on in a vehicle like this. And this car could get 65 miles per gallon. It was fast, 7.5 seconds, zero to 60 is completely competent, safe and, and comfortable for two people as a two seater. So why do manufacturers take so long to adopt the, the, the series hybrid design, which is kind of obviously the way to go. I mean, any physicist would tell you, do it this way but they don't, and that's kind of interesting. I think that says something about how the, the long cycle times that seem to be inherent in our manufacturing system, especially when it comes to transportation, just doesn't really seem necessary when we already know that there are better ways. And only now, just barely, are we actually starting to see series hybrids on the road. So we're really interested in, in changing that and making these cycles happen fast. Why should there be good ideas out there that aren't on the market right now? So early in my teaching career, I got really excited about this uh, project with the students. These are um, PUD Electrothon racers. They use two car batteries in each car to carry a student, high school age, around a track. The car that goes the farthest in an hour is the winner. It, it emphasizes efficiency and good design. It's a great project because the students have got their hands on it. They're solving a real problem. They're working together. They're collaborating. They're using new technology to develop new things. That car in the background there, which we called our number five car, uh, eventually set a, a world record at the time. It went over 40 miles in one hour off the power of two car batteries on the racetrack down at Portland, uh, Portland International Speedway. That's Evergreen Speedway in Monroe right there. Pretty good project. I really got excited about things like this, but you know what happened? Eventually the cars got so good that new teams couldn't hope to join and be competitive. The, the, the teams that had been doing it for only two or three years learned so much that their cars were just way faster, way more efficient than the new teams. And that's what happens in auto racing sometimes. If one team becomes dominant, then it's not competitive and, and interest soon wanes. So like a lot of these projects, like the Science Olympiad, the hybrid electric vehicle, it's kind of a dead ender a little bit. Yeah, the students learn some stuff, but the cars themselves languish in some closet somewhere and it doesn't go anywhere any further. Here's another example of that here. Um, we tried, the, the teachers involved in this tried to scale the project even closer to the students. So stepping back to the electric bikes, oh. yeah, you got it. Um, the, it seems like a little bit of a scale down, but it seemed to fit better the students. And we liked it because now you're really having the students solve a problem that is truly their own to, to own. Students mostly don't have driver's license and, and cars aren't exactly the solution for them. But bikes, in particular electric bikes, those actually can be a solution for students. So now you're applying the students directly on to, towards projects and problems that are relevant to them, which I think is a really great thing to pass along. These projects were a lot of fun um, and they went well, but at the end the students leave and the bikes kind of rust and go fall into pieces and everything. So it's again, it's a little bit dead ended. And here's another one. This is a thermal photovoltaic vehicle at Western Washington University. I got involved in this one in uh, the late 90s. It's uh, enormously complex. It uses a really, really advanced, sophisticated power generation system that really would belong more on a spaceship than on a car. It would probably take me too long to uh, describe it to you right now, but you can just tell by how long the word is that it must be really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff and really advanced, really something to be proud of, but again, kind of a dead ender. Like, yeah, we, we got to work with the other students and we got to see what the other universities were doing and everything, but I guarantee you that car sitting outside of, at the paddock in the parking lot outside of the Vehicle Research Institute up at Western Washington University in Bellingham, and it's sitting right next to about 20 more cars just like it, dating all the way back to the 70s. Wonderful projects. It's one of the greatest programs around. but kind of a dead ender, where does it go? So disillusioned, I leave education, but I could never completely put this stuff behind me. I stayed involved with the Seattle Electric Vehicle Association and through that involvement, I found myself teaching a little weekend class on electric bike construction down at South Seattle uh, Community College, which is a lot of fun. 
I met some really interesting people. I met one old guy, his name was Larry. He came down on his electric bike from North Seattle. He rode the, the days that we held class all the way down to South Seattle. And Larry's up there, like he's well past retirement, not necessarily the athletic type. But it's something that he's really passionate about and he really believed. And I was struck by people like this. You know, here they are coming to, to come. He, Larry didn't really need to know how to make electric bikes. He already had one. He's really just looking for like-minded people to, to network with because he has a goal. His goal is to bring electric bikes to the people. He really believes that people in, in his age category can benefit from these kinds of things. That sort of combination of efficient transportation and mild exercise can be really good for anybody. And so he's trying to network with other people. And I still run into Larry at, at green car shows and at the, a uh, few weeks ago, we at the Snohomish County Public Utilities District, they had a big symposium on the integration of electric cars. And guys like Larry and guys like the, that I meet at the Seattle Electric Vehicle Association and people like that I meet at Wikispeed, they're all interested in creating a whole system that involves um, higher efficiency. So, next slide, please. So when I came across Wikispeed, because one of the other students in my class was Joe Justice, and he told me about his little project. And as he started to explain it, I recognized the same kind of thing that I've been involved with in the past. But here for the first time was something that didn't have a dead end, that looked like this is a complete system using the, the methodologies that he's explaining to me, which to me were completely new at the time. I, I could see how this could actually work. The whole point about modularity was really exciting to me because I've always been interested in engine design and development, but man, that's a really specialized field. You don't even meet people who, who work in that field out here very often. Most of them live in other places like in Michigan, and they're part of gigantic teams and you know, just nothing I ever thought that I would be able to do. But with modular design, we can take advantage of any engine design or motor design that's out there. So I get excited when I see new unusual developments in motor design and I want to contact those people and say, look, why would you not want to uh, develop at least one of your prototypes that is that will integrate into our module. It's a very simple thing to do. And now you've got a, a platform to test it in, a potentially a whole new list of clients that you could sell it to, and a great chance for development. And when I reach them, they often agree. And we've had several offers to uh, to build electric, sophisticated electric drivetrains and some other exciting things, and, and we're working on those right now. It's a win-win. So, I really like it. I think something like this could be a game changer in the same way that the Model T was a game changer. With the Model T, you had a car that was designed not to be super complicated. It wasn't the most sophisticated design that Ford had come up with at the time. But it had the main, it had the basic features that people really needed. And he paid his factory workers better, not necessarily just because he loved them, but because he knew that he, if, if his factory workers made enough money to afford this less expensive car that was being developed, that now he's sort of socializing a technology that previously had been a little bit the realm of the more wealthy and privileged. So he socialized new technology and created something that really changed the world. That's what we're trying to do. So I started going to these Wikispeed meetings and, and participating in the shop, learning the lean, agile, scrum methodologies, and applying them any way I could. And what's the benefit to me? Well, it's like a, it's like a self-guided educational tour. I choose the kinds of things that I'm interested in the project and where I put my time, just as all the, the other team members do too. But I benefit from the interactions that I have with the other people, many of whom I've never met face to face. <laughs> Or, or I've only interchanged phone calls or things like that. I benefit from all of that networking and I feel like I'm part of something that really has momentum and will not be a dead end project that will have great results. So this is myself and a couple of other team members. Uh, we're at the Chamber of Commerce building in downtown Seattle uh, talking to important political people, uh, looking for support and, and to see how they uh, could point us to programs that we could integrate with educational and or uh, <coughs> manufacturing or integration into existing systems. This is uh, inside Roush Engineering in Livona, Michigan. Now Roush subcontracts for the big three automakers. They do a lot of the engine certification, the crash testing, airbag development for other car companies. And there we are with our car in Roush doing engine testing. And the next slide here shows our car strapped to a $1 million chassis dynamometer. This is for final certification to determine what kind of mileage we can get. And those are Wikispeed members working right alongside the engineers from Roush. Now, a machine like that costs thousands of dollars an hour. There's five engineers just standing around looking at you. 
Um, that's pretty expensive, but we got that for free. They're just excited about it. They gave us the time, and a lot of our stuff goes that way. This is uh, the future of Flight Museum at the end of Payne Field. Uh, here, the, the finest aircraft in the world are delivered to their customers, so when the first 787 was delivered a few months ago, they poke it in a million dollar glass garage door, the nose of the plane comes into the building, and some very important people come and look at these things. The museum itself is designed to inspire people to get involved and to see themselves uh, as part of the, the problem solving process. So they invited us to, to show in the museum. This is a temporary exhibit of one of our chassis, but a full, a permanent exhibit is, is in the works and will be in there probably by Valentine's Day. Because in addition to the rich and powerful purchasers of airplanes, thousands of, of young people come into this museum every year on school field trips. And a project like this is really exciting to the regents of the museum who, who you know, realize that a, a, a exhibit where the students can get in and sit in it and turn the wheel, get excited about it, and then at the end it says, hey, you too can get involved. And we do have high school students on our team. We've even had productive involvement by people younger than that. In fact, some of my favorite uh, interactions are when we have a parent uh, and, the, and their kid come in and work together. I think that's so important that there's more of that kind of stuff out there, and I love it when it happens, and it happens a lot with us. These are students at the Art Institute of Seattle. This is their industrial design club. This is a great example of the kind of person that, that we could, that can really benefit from the interaction with our network. These students are looking for reasons to design stuff and they're looking for audiences to view what they design and, and stages upon which to, which to show it. So we come to them with uh, problems and they iterate on their ideas and look at those beautiful sketches they make. And then in the next slide, you can see they get really excited. <laughs> And, uh, and share with us what I consider really first-rate intellectual um, collateral. This is, these are great ideas from avid, energetic, creative people. And it's the age of information, so we seem to get them more or less for free. Now, other automakers might spend $100 million putting a new, uh, new car on the market. And we have no debt at all. And we're getting close to having our first uh, saleable car on the road. One of the other things I see is that just it's a chance for these students to also work on a project that's not a dead end, that actually has a life beyond this as well. Yeah, I think of Rob Morbacher over there in Maryland designing car bodies and actually getting them built. That, you know, that kind of thing didn't used to happen. There's me and Brian Ford. Brian lives out in Michigan. You know, word about Michigan, you know, there's a place that really could use some help. And they get really excited when we go and talk to their chamber of commerce and some of their economic development people. And guys like Brian are psyched too, because he and all his friends, they've got car, they've got 10W40 running right through their blood. They're, you know, talented, committed automotive people. But man, times are pretty tough over there. I was really struck and touched by not only the friendliness of Michigan people, but how kind of dire their situation is. But this is a life changer for a guy like Brian. He's built our Michigan prototype, and, and you know he's proud of his, his job and his life and everything, but I think that perhaps Wikispeed is the thing he's most proud of. And here he and I are teaching ourselves to weld on the arc welder that we got from Everlast. And another point about that, we did a lot of our initial welding instruction just on really kind of junky equipment. You can get a welder from Harbor Freight for a about the cost of the box to put it in. And it works about that good too, but it's good for learning. And after a while, and it's true about those YouTube videos, Kurt, who I know is out here in the audience somewhere, sent me a whole bunch of videos right off YouTube, and, and that moved us a long ways down the line. And because we're all working together, there's a lot of critique and, and back and forth, and, and we pretty much got it now. Oh, and by the way, after Everlast, the company we bought the first welder from found out what we we're doing, they gave us another one, just gave it to us. And that kind of thing's happened quite a bit. So now Brian's got a welder back in Michigan too. This is the Seattle Electric Vehicle Association, another group that we like to work with. These guys are boisterous. This is the, the largest and one of the oldest electric vehicle associations in the country. They meet about once a month and uh, they're a great group. They could, they're, you're looking at some of the more knowledgeable people about um, alternative vehicle systems, and a lot of these guys are really committed. Some of them are XPRIZE contestants themselves. Several of them hold world records. Uh, a lot of them are very, very politically active uh, in trying to help create the legislation and the climate for uh, a better way. And uh, they, they, we like to work with them as well because it, we create a momentum that they don't normally have. Individuals building interesting electric cars in their garages, that's great art, but it doesn't, 
again, it's a little bit dead-ended, and you can see by the look on their faces how excited they are. So uh, we make a lot of friends, and we have a really good time at our meetings. I was trying to figure out a good way to sum this up, and just yesterday I came across an email from a brand new team member. When people join, they, they're asked to just kind of introduce themselves to the team on the Gmail and, and uh, tell us a little bit about what their interests are. And this guy said, uh, yeah, I've been fortunate to run across some fine and knowledgeable people, each trying in their own way to find solutions to the big problems which we'll pass on to our children. And I thought, you know, that's pretty heavy. Because one thing for sure, we are passing on some really big problems. And that's something to think about. I think that creates a responsibility in us. Because if we can come up with at least an idea for how to solve those problems, a set of solutions, and a culture that would support it, then we're giving them the keys. And we owe them those keys. Is there anything else? So if you want to get involved, or if you know anybody that you think would like to get involved, please do. Uh, you can check out our website or find us on Facebook, um, or you can just get in touch with us personally through the group email. And of course, I'd be happy to pass out any of my own information to anybody who has any you know, specific questions or wants to get immediately and directly involved. Um, the question that I would have for you is, why wouldn't you get involved in something like this? It's not just about cars. Cars is just kind of the sexy thing that we're talking about right now. Uh, Wikispeed has interest in solving all kinds of problems using these methodologies. So the question is, is how might you get involved in something like this or people that you know? And how might it benefit your life in the way that's benefited so many people already? Yeah. And this time we'll take questions. Thank you, Tom and Rob and Team Thank Wikispeed. You. So I'll, I'll run the mic up and we'll get some, uh, some of these questions. And uh, Dino's got one in the back. I didn't see any doors on that car. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a great observation, and it's just about the first thing that comes up almost all the time. And uh, I'm glad that you gave me an opportunity to talk about that. The, we've identified that you know, we will probably make 50 of this particular modular design. So this is the very early adopters model. So I don't want you to think, like, I think can I say 10. that? Oh, maybe 10? I think it's limited to 10 production. Maybe just 10. Uh, don't think Apple II, think Apple I. You ever see one of those, <laughs> right? The box with nothing? That's kind of where we start. But there are people who wish they had one. You know, I kind of wish I had an Apple I now, right? They're pretty valuable. And so climbing over the door sill, which is actually only 20 inches off the ground, seems like something that uh, a sacrifice that an early adopter will make. But we're also very aware that we want something that eventually lots of people will adopt. And for sure, future designs will be a little bit more user friendly. We're actually really excited about building a, um, a work van version, because there's an awful lot of work vans out there crawling along getting you know, single digit gas mileage. Uh, if we could make something like that that was highly efficient, then that would be a, something that could really change things. So for now, we ask the early adopters to step over the sill, and uh, they don't seem to mind too much. Rob, got another one here? Yes, sir. Forget the doors. Will it hold a 20-ounce latte? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. It's modular. We can make it hold anything you want. <laughs> I, I think he's wanted to volunteer for the design team for that feature. Fantastic. I'd love it. You know, sometimes the, our, our, our most ardent critics are the ones, you know, those kind of the people you want to talk to sometimes because they have passionate ideas. We do have a dashboard design team you can join, actually. Yes. <laughs> Hi, guys. It's, uh, first off, I, I'm, I'm just shocked and awed. This is just amazing, this project. And I know, you, right? Well, Washington State has Yeah, I just finished reading Bob, Bob Lutz's book, uh, Car Guys and Bean Counters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he talks about at General Motors is how when he unharnessed or unrestrained, a lot of guys who'd worked there for 25 or 30 years, they started developing solutions and fit and finish mm -hmm. and were able to really bring a quality product around. So the talent had been there all the time, but because of internal processes that constrained them and we did things, why do we do things a certain way? Well, because that's the way we've been doing it for 40 years, <laughs> right? And right. these guys had great ideas and they cut them loose. Um, just a, a couple other comments. I'm, I'm a, a big car guy, right? And I been proud of the fact that I've been able to take a four-door business sedan and drive it down to 4.1 seconds, zero to 60. That's what got my attention, yes. was the zero to 60 time, and still maintain 27 to 28 miles per gallon on the highway. Well, uh, I'm a little humbled in that. And part of that story is that I'm a big fan of Steve Dynan, of Dynan Engineering, sure. and people think of tuning and modifications, and they think of headers and cold air intakes and exhaust systems and, and all the rest, but really half of Steve's business is software engineering. 
and he's coming in, and I mean, I picked up 120 pounds of, uh, uh, pounds of torque, 89 horsepower with the software, software upgrade. Mm -hmm. Had no mechanical parts whatsoever about it. So I, I was just surfing all your stuff and found some of the specs, and I see you've been using, um, on the one particular one, the 1.8 liter Honda, mm -hmm. um, uh, four liter engine. And, and wonder what, what software you've been doing around that. Have you been doing any tuning within that? Or? What we started with is we've, we've used the, the Honda wiring harness, and we've stuck with that entirely. Um, that's not the long-term plan, but being agile, we often use what, will, what, what is needed for the moment. And, and as, we've, as we identify new needs, we sort of change things. So part of our fuel savings is actually achieved electronically by modulating the throttle. It's sort of a drive-by-wire throttle system that to make a long story short, it, it w would do high frequency pulsing of the motor, the effect being to keep the motor in its most efficient operating regimes for most of the time. And then and we use uh, Arduino circuits, which are open source circuit boards. And uh, to be honest, that's not exactly my strongest point, so I may misspeak this a little bit, but, but we're trying to integrate as much open source electronics with it as we can for sort of obvious reasons. And bit by bit, we're cutting away the old Honda wiring harness. Um, it's a tricky process, though, because you can't really describe modern cars as having a computer. <laughs> They've got a whole bunch of computers. Any, any modern car today has more computing power than Houston Control did back in the 60s, putting people on the moon. And so when you cut away one little piece of it, what you didn't realize was, well, it turns out that the electric window thing was actually talking to the central engine management computer. And now that you cut the electric window thing away because of us not having electric windows, you've confused the rest of it. So um, those are the kinds of challenges that we come across. Those could be game enders for, the, for an individual or a small group trying to develop something like this. There have been production cars out there, Aston Martin Lagonda comes to mind, where their, their electronics development went completely out of control and essentially ruined an otherwise potentially successful car. And so, you know, again, trying to take advantage of the modern information age where information, while still valuable, becomes cheap or at least easy to, to acquire. Uh, that's where we're trying to go is towards more open source stuff. So what we might do is, for example, change to a simplified racing harness that just manages the engine and then essentially build our own circuitry for all the other ancillary systems from open source um, sources. And using Cat5 cable to... Oh, yeah, yeah. We're trying to use Cat5 cable to transmit a lot of the power and around our the, car. Make the electrical system modular as well. Right, as simple as possible. Not surprisingly, that's one of the, the bigger challenges, but we're making good progress. Another one over here. Um, when I uh, buy one of these and I inevitably get into a fender bender, does it just come with a carbon fiber toolkit so I can clean it up myself? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. There's a couple ways to look at that. Our current body design is a single piece, which is unusual in full-scaled cars, but it's actually common in really small vehicles like go-karts or rated control cars. We've gotten the carbon fiber body price down to the point where that whole body costs about as much as a fender, a steel fender on a modern car. So my wife got tagged in a parking lot a little while ago and the poor guy left a note, good for him. Little scratches in the paint on the rear bumper, no indentation at all, $800. Well that happened to be how much our entire carbon fiber body costs. So, so because of the modular design, is that kind of the maintain, is that the uh, maintenance strategy you guys have in plan for this? Modularity this really opens up a whole yes. new world when it comes to service. Because suddenly you have a car, say you've got an engine that's bad, you limp the car into the dealership, instead of the dealer holding on to your transportation system for the next three weeks and fumbling away at it, you know, a relatively untrained technician would snap that motor right out of the car, put in a new one, possibly a better motor than the original one, or at least different in some other way. Meanwhile, the original motor is worked, maybe shipped somewhere to where a whole bunch of experts can really analyze it and do a better job, value added, repairs made, and then that goes back on the shelf. The point is the customer just left immediately after arriving at the dealer with not only a fixed motor, but very possibly a better one than the one that they had. And those modular bodies are nice too. We, we hope that people would have several of them so you can have your, you know, your sedate car, your Batmobile. You can switch out the convertible with a pickup yeah, truck. Yeah, things for like that. That's how modular it can be. Yeah. Future designs uh, may have a, more than one part. Uh, maybe the, the body breaks into three parts. That seems to happen pretty easily. We'll see. It's, it's uh, us and you that will help figure that out. 
Uh, Rob, there's another one up in the, towards the back. Nino's running around with a mic up there. Have you, have you got it to him? Yep. Um, producing a, a product like that at $25,000, what's the most expensive parts that, or even services maybe, that contribute to that cost? Well, when we come up with $25,000, that's an honest, that's intended to be an honest price. By the way, that's current right now, what we think we could actually sell one for, given what we know our labor costs would be if we actually started paying people. Once, we, once the first car is taken delivery, you know, we can't really expect people to continue volunteering for this company. You know, we're going to have to start paying people, but that's always been factored in. And right now, we're at about 25000 bucks. 17999 is actually the goal, because that happens to be the median price for, for a new car, and that sounds real affordable. So to answer your question. The, I think the biggest parts now are the engine itself and the materials that go into it as yeah, well. Yeah, it's so we, engine we use, materials. You know, very, very high quality, lightweight materials in the, the production of our cars. And so the, frame, the frame is kind of an abstraction of, of existing car frame designs. I mean, think of a spider web and its complexity. And then imagine reducing that spider web so that it's just three strands, like a triangle. That's real simple and real cheap. Not as effective as the complicated spider web, but if you think about it, it actually might still work a little bit. And that clever spider could make hundreds of them. And in fact, spiders actually do do this. Only some spiders make one single complicated web. Mostly they just make a bunch of mess and bugs get stuck in it. That's the same sort of thing we've done. The frame is an abstraction of the really complex welded tube frames that you see in a lot of high performance cars. But by reducing it down to this much simpler design, it actually works better. Those big, long aluminum bars, those are one piece of aluminum all the way from the front to the back of the car, one set of crystal grains with no interruptions or welds or joints or anything. So you can see that that actually is extremely strong. And although it looks perhaps less intricate, it turns out to be the better solution. We probably have time for one more question. Has anybody got one? Yeah, I have one. I you, you talk about the, the optimization of the engine and how you use it to optimize. How does that work, break down the engine itself? So mm. when you run a, an engine at optimize, you know, optimized speed, it's running faster, it's more engine wear, right. more engine breakdown. How, how do you guys factor that in? The engine that, in? that we, we, we use, we chose because it was one of the most efficient gas engines produced. If another one comes out that's better, we'll probably pick that one up. But. Uh, all internal combustion engines have certain regimes under which they tend to be more efficient. That is typically at high, uh, let me think here, high speed and high load that, they, that they, you find a more efficient operating regime. Uh, people who do hypermiling, who, who try to get really high mileage out of regular cars, will drive with a technique they call pulse and glide. So what they're doing is they, they open the throttle wide open, go from 20 to 30 miles an hour, then once they reach 30, they shut everything down and they coast back down to 20. And then they, they go back and forth like that. Um, that effectively keeps the engine more often in the high load, high speed range. And so overall, they get better mileage than if they cruised normally. When you're cruising normally, your throttle's most of the way closed, and that actually is quite inefficient. You get a lot of pumping losses and things like that. So people have been doing this for a long time, but it's, it's not the sort of way most people would normally want to drive. But just as anti-lock braking systems became practical once the microprocessor control was able to bring the frequency of the pulsing down to the point where the grainy just, graininess just sort of washes out and it seems smooth, we think we can achieve the same thing electronically with the throttle and achieve higher efficiency just through electronic modulation in the same way. And by the way, what's cool about that technique, which astoundingly no one seems to have come up with, even though it's just flat obvious, it's a known idea, and no one else is doing it to my knowledge, that same technique can be applied to all gasoline engines in cars boats, possibly even airplanes under certain circumstances. And even if it only improved mileage by 5 or 10% implied over the entire transportation industry, that's a real big difference. That could really make a difference. Hmm. And we like to think that you know, only a company like this that thinks that far out of the box would come up with this. Automotive engineers aren't interested in ways to reduce the power of their engine and to make the throttle pulse on and off. That's not really the way they think. But, but maybe sometimes some of them do. And I think that they're better able, to, better able to express themselves in an organization like Wikispeed than they are in an organization like General Motors or Mercedes-Benz. Okay, thank, thank you, Tom and Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.